About a decade ago, I was making videos like this one here, predicting that we were moving into a new golden age of heavyweight boxing. I uploaded this video in 2015, and in fact, in this video, I was referencing earlier videos where I was saying the same thing. Now, at the time, I was in the minority of people saying this. Most people were dismissing the idea. There were other YouTubers saying, ah, oh, it's no golden age, it'll be a bronze age at best. They just couldn't see what to me was obvious. Other people were saying it can't be a golden age because this new crop of heavyweights would never have lasted in the 90s or the 70s. And my answer to them was, well, that's just your opinion. My definition of a golden age isn't based on some arbitrary assessment of how well the current crop of heavyweights would have fared against the heavyweights of yesteryear. Because unless you've got a time machine, then there's no way to find out. My definition of a golden age is based on four criteria. Number one being fierce competition among the top guys. Not one of these eras where you've got a monolithic champion who's head and shoulders above everybody else, who nobody can even come close to beating. That's not a golden age. Golden age is when competition at the top and even lower down in the division is fierce. The second criteria is loads of exciting fights. And if you think back over the past decade, that's exactly what we've had. I mean, just compare it to the previous era, the Klitschko era. It's night and day. Going back to 2015, there was AJ Dillon White, AJ Klitschko, Dillon White, Derek Chisora, twice. Dillon White, Joseph Parker, Chisora Takam. Lower down, you had people like Dominic Brazil in an absolute barn burner against Izzy Ogono. You guys remember that fight? You had the Fury Wilder trilogy. Two of those three fights were very competitive. And the third one in particular was extremely dramatic. You've had Jelly Zhang emerge on the scene in exciting fights against people like Hergovic, Joyce, Deontay Wilder, of course, Andy Ruiz. His first fight with AJ was very exciting, etc., etc. So that box is ticked very much so in this era. Exciting fights. The third criteria is upsets. You can't have a golden age of heavyweight boxing without upsets. Have we had that? Yes, we have. I just mentioned one, the biggest one so far, at least on paper in terms of the odds. To me, it wasn't really a massive upset because I gave Ruiz a good chance, but most other people did not. So you had Ruiz beating AJ. I mean, even Tyson Fury beating Klitschko was seen as an upset by many. A lot of people saw Zhang beating Joyce as an upset. You had Michael Hunter stopping Martin Bacoli at your call. That was an upset. In fact, many people even saw Usyk beating Joshua as an upset. So that box is ticked as well. And the fourth and final criteria is public interest, public engagement. Are the public interested in the current crop of heavyweights? And that is a resounding yes. There's far more public interest in this current heavyweight era than there was in the previous heavyweight era, the Klitschko era, far more. And it's largely down to the fact that the three previous criteria I spoke about were met. Now, there have been instances where the three previous criteria, or arguably at least two of them, were met, but the public still weren't very interested. An example might be the Larry Holmes era in the late 70s, early 80s. Competition was pretty tough. Holmes won the title in an absolute classic against Ken Norton. And during his reign, he had plenty of adversity to overcome. Dropped by Ernie Shavers. I mean, how on earth he got up from that punch, I will never know. Dropped by Ronaldo Snipes. Pushed in many other fights against the likes of Carl Williams, Tim Witherspoon, etc., etc. There were also upsets in that era. I mean, Holmes was a victim of one of them himself when he got beat by Michael Spinks. Or how about when Trevor Burbick knocked out John Tate? But the public engagement, the public interest just wasn't there. And there were plenty of exciting fights. Now, a big factor in that was the shadow of Muhammad Ali, which still loomed large over the heavyweight division. Ali was such a massive character. Obviously, there's the fact that he achieved an awful lot, but the character of the man was so larger than life. It was an almost impossible act for Larry Holmes to follow or any of the other belt holders during that era. And unfortunately, a lot of them fell into the trap of trying to copy Muhammad Ali a bit. Not just in terms of his fighting style, and many of them tried to do that, but even his personality. I mean, Larry Holmes was coming out with poems and whatever, like Ali. Obviously, Larry Holmes came up under Ali as his sparring partner, and he fought him, of course, when Ali was completely washed up. But yeah, Holmes was trying to come with poems, you know, Ali-style poems, 
and it was just unbelievably cringe. The press criticized him for it. The public were turned off by it. They used to say that Holmes had no charisma. And this kind of triggered Holmes into becoming a very bitter character. And that's really how Larry Holmes was throughout his entire boxing career. He just came across as very, very bitter. So for those reasons, the Larry Holmes era was not a golden age. When you look at the previous golden ages in heavyweight boxing, let's say the 1970s, there was no monolithic champion. All the top guys were swapping wins and losses. There were upsets all over the place. Similar situation in the 1990s, the most recent golden era of heavyweight boxing prior to this current one. No monolithic champion. The top guys swapping wins and losses. Loads of exciting fights. And crucially, public engagement. But as I've said many times before, the 90s really wasn't appreciated at the time. It was full of boxing fans and boxing pundits talking about how weak the division was year after year after year. That's all you would hear from them. I remember I was there. The turning point really came after Evander Holyfield beat Mike Tyson because the narrative up to that point was that none of these guys could have laced Mike Tyson's boots, as in Holyfield, Bo, Lennox Lewis. And so when he gets out of jail, he's gonna destroy all these guys. That was the narrative. And Evander Holyfield on November 9th, 1996, turned that narrative on its head. He forced people to reassess. All of a sudden they were thinking, well, maybe this era isn't so bad after all. Because here we have Evander Holyfield, a guy who already lost to Riddick Bowe twice, lost to Michael Moore as well, was seemingly at the end of his career, looking like a jaded, washed up fighter. Gets in there with Mike Tyson, who's been blowing everybody away since he came out of prison, and he stops him in 11 rounds. And of course, we all know what happened in the rematch. So that was a pivotal moment really for the 90s heavyweight era in terms of the public perception of it. The public gained a lot more respect for that era after that. Now, the 90s heavyweight era kicked off with the biggest upset in heavyweight history. Maybe the biggest upset in boxing history, period, which was Buster Douglas knocking out Mike Tyson in Tokyo for the undisputed heavyweight title. That's how the 90s kicked off in the heavyweight division, with Mike Tyson, this seemingly invincible fighter, getting knocked out by a massive underdog. And throughout the 90s, I mean, the upsets just kept coming and coming. When Lennox Lewis knocked out Razor Ruddock, I mean, Lewis was an underdog, not massive, but he was an underdog. Him winning the fight wasn't inconceivable, but the way he won the fight shocked the boxing world. He blasted Razor Ruddock out in two rounds. That was an absolute shocker to most people. There was the incredible trilogy between Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe. Lewis suffered an upset loss at the hands of Oliver McCall. Tommy Morrison suffered an upset loss at the hands of Michael Bent. I've already spoken about Holyfield upsetting Tyson. George Foreman became the oldest heavyweight champion in history, upsetting Michael Mora. I mean, even when Michael Mora won the heavyweight title off Holyfield, that was seen as an upset. When Riddick Bowe got the stuffing beaten out of him by Andrew Galotta, even though officially Riddick Bowe won those fights by disqualification, they were almost like losses, you know? So yeah, the 90s was just like musical chairs. There was no monolithic champion. The public were interested, particularly after Mike Tyson was defeated. Now, they were always interested in the Holyfield Bowe trilogy because the first fight was just so good that they wanted to see the second and third fights, right? And Riddick Bowe was a character. And that right there is probably the main factor when it comes to public engagement, the characters. Mike Tyson, of course, was a character. Riddick Bowe was a character. George Foreman was a character. Tommy Morrison, I don't know whether he was a character, but he represented something for a certain demographic in the United States, particularly in the South. Lennox Lewis wasn't really much of a character, but he was made into a caricature by the American boxing media. A caricature of an Englishman, right? They used to do that a lot back then in the pre-internet age. They literally thought everybody in England was like an aristocrat or something. <laughs> it's the strangest thing. You had promoters who were characters, obviously. Don King, Rock Newman, Lou Duva. These were big characters. Obviously, Bob Arum was around then too. Frank Bruno was a character. He was still knocking around in the 90s. That's when he won his heavyweight title from Oliver McCall. So lots of colorful characters and that helped to generate public interest. The Klitschko era, which followed the 90s, you could say started off quite well, but maybe it was really the end of the old era. And that was the Lennox Lewis 
Vitaly Klitschko fight. That was a great fight, but that was the only great fight we would ever see in the Klitschko era because the competition just wasn't there for the next decade or so. Now, Vladimir did get upset a couple times, but that was against fighters who were actually on their way out. Ross Purity, Corey Sanders, even Lamont Brewster. They were all on their way out when they beat Vladimir Klitschko, which then left the division open for the next decade after that when Klitschko, Vladimir that is, came back to have a, another reign. But yeah, that Klitschko era was really a dark age for heavyweight boxing. Public interest fell off to almost nothing. Competition was nothing like fierce for the majority of that period. There were no real characters. You know, the Klitschkos were very sterile. It got so bad that fans were pinning their hopes on people like Shannon Briggs when he was totally washed up. There was so little interest that HBO and Showtime stopped showing Klitschko fights. An extraordinary thing and a common thread throughout the Klitschko era was not only a lack of talent, but a lack of heavyweights that were in shape and also big enough to compete with the Klitschkos. Because the few that were big enough weren't athletes, and the ones who were athletes weren't big enough. And so when Tyson Fury emerged on the scene, and later Anthony Joshua, I could see right away that this was something different. And I predicted at the time, this was long before Tyson Fury had beat Klitschko. This is when Vladimir Klitschko was looking like he was going to remain undefeated until he retires. Obviously, he'd lost previously in his career, but I mean, on this unbeaten streak he was on. It seemed to most people that that streak wouldn't be broken and he wouldn't suffer another loss before he retires. But when I was looking at the new crop of heavyweights, I said in my videos at the time, there is no way the Vladimir Klitschko is going to go through this new crop of heavyweights and come out without tasting defeat. There's just no way. I can't tell you which guy's going to beat him, but there's just no way he's going to get through this new current crop. No, this new crop. No way. Because these guys are not like the heavyweights of the previous few years. Little guys like David Hay or big slow guys like Marius Wack. No, these are big guys who are athletic. These are big guys. You know, Deontay Wilder was emerging on the scene as well. These are big guys who are in shape, who've got speed and power. This is very, very different to the contenders that were knocking around in the Klitschko era. I recognized that right away. But I also recognized something which, after Fury had beaten Klitschko, most other fans at the time struggled to recognize. And that was that of the three emerging big names in the heavyweight division at the time, that was Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua, and Deontay Wilder. Of those three, none of them would escape the era without tasting defeat. I was saying that in this video right here. I was 100% confident that all of them would lose unless, you know, they retired prematurely or did an amazing job of ducking everybody. I was absolutely certain that they would all taste defeat. The reason that most fans at the time couldn't see it is because love is blind. They were too in love with their favorite fighter, be it Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, or Deontay Wilder. The love that fans had for any one of those three heavyweights blinded them to the obvious weaknesses that they all always had. I mean, Tyson Fury should have had a loss on his record before he even fought Klitschko. In the first John McDermott fight, he was dropped by Nevin Pikich. He was dropped by Steve Cunningham. Why anybody ever came up with this notion that Tyson Fury was invincible and would go on to be a monolithic champion that nobody could touch is baffling. Even in his prime, the weaknesses were there. Similar situation with Anthony Joshua. The weaknesses were always there. Same goes for Deontay Wilder. In this video right here, I was saying that Anthony Joshua is definitely going to lose before he fights Wilder or Tyson Fury. Said it right here in this video that you can see on screen, still up on my channel. I said, I don't know whether Povetkin's going to be the guy to do it, but there's a loss incoming for Joshua. I could feel it in the air. And of course, it was in his very next fight against Andy Ruiz. And so I'm not trying to claim to be some Nostradamus here. Not at all. I was just able to recognize the signs because I'd seen them before in the 90s. And because I wasn't so emotionally attached to any of these fighters, I was able to see their weaknesses, which made me know all these guys are going to lose. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing for the heavyweight division. Boxing thrives on drama. Upsets are good for boxing. Now, I say all that to give you the bad news, <laughs> which is that this golden era is coming to an end. The next generation of heavyweights are talented, but I don't see characters among them that would capture the imagination of the public like the old guard. 
AJ Fury, Wilder. And by the way, I should just mention Alexander Usyk here, because when I made the prediction that all the top guys in the heavyweight division were going to lose, Usyk wasn't yet a heavyweight. I'm not sure if Usyk's going to lose because I don't know whether he's going to box on long enough. If he continues till he's, let's say, 40, and he's still having mandatories and doing all that and boxing regularly, then yeah, he's going to lose. But if he beats Tyson Fury in the rematch, assuming that fight goes ahead, he might just retire after that and have a perfect record and become only the second heavyweight champion in history after Rocky Marciano to retire without a defeat. And Usyk himself is a great character. Certainly not bland like his countryman Vladimir Klitschko. Great character. But yeah, the new crop of heavyweights coming through, I'm not saying they're Vladimir Klitschko bland, but you've got Jared Anderson, who's got a very kind of generic young American hood guy image. You got Bakadir Jalilov, who's whatever, you know, in terms of his character. You got Daniel Dubois. He's part of the new generation, even though he's fighting the older generation. He's part of the new generation, right? He's only 26. You got Moses Atalma coming through, who I think is very talented, but he's no Tyson Fury, you know, in terms of character or Alexander Usyk or even Deontay Wilder, as ridiculous as Wilder was. He was a character. This uncouth, country bumpkin. I mean, the guy used to wear zoot suits. <laughs> Go back and look at some of his appearances at ringside for fights. Early on in his reign as WBC champion, man was wearing zoot suits. <laughs> How country is that? Who else you got in the younger generation? Fabio Wardley? He does have a pretty nice following, to be fair, but it's not Anthony Joshua, is it? It's not that kind of following. He doesn't generate that kind of public excitement. And so the moral of the story here is appreciate this current heavyweight era because it's nearly over. I mean, maybe AJ will hang around the longest. Usyk's pushing 40. Tyson Fury's got loads of miles on the clock. If AJ comes through Dubois, might get another two years out of him. Three at a push. But if that does happen, he'll be part of this transition phase from the old to the new. And he might bow out, let's say two years from now, losing to one of the new crop. I could see that. There are still going to be people in the comment section of this video claiming that this was never a golden era. Again, people were saying the exact same thing in the 90s. <laughs> Heard it all before, mate. Decades from now, the very same people claiming that this era is rubbish and the talent pool is shallow. 20 years from now, they'll be telling their kids and their grandkids about how great this era was. Oh yes, they will. Just like the clowns in the 90s who were saying that it was a rubbish era. Today are talking about how great it was. They've forgotten all about the stuff that they said back then. It's incredible. <laughs> Unbelievable. But I can assure you, they were all saying it was rubbish and none of these guys can fight. Now they're telling their kids, oh, the 90s was an amazing time. <laughs> amazing time for heavyweight boxing. There were so much better fighters back then. Mm. Weren't saying that at the time, mate. So it goes today as well. This era won't be fully appreciated until maybe 10 years in the future, 15 years. Then people will look back and say, wow. What a great time to be a boxing fan. Those heavyweights back there were going at it. So many characters, so many great fights, so much excitement, so many upsets, dramatic knockouts, trilogies, seesaw battles, the emergence of an unexpected king in Alexander Usyk, right? How many people predicted that he would sit on top of the heavyweight pile by the end of it? He came out of left field like a dark horse to most boxing fans. So appreciate this time while it's here, folks appreciate it because it is a golden age and i'm not saying the next heavyweight era is going to be bad but it won't be quite like this one this was such a golden age that even a trial horse like derek chisora was able to sell out arenas now some people might see that as an indication that it's a bad era not a good era no it's an indication that even guys much lower down the pecking order like del boy were benefiting from the excitement generated further up the rankings I mean, Derek Chisora talked openly about this with regards to Anthony Joshua. He spoke about how great it was AJ being heavyweight champion because it brought excitement to British boxing and therefore paydays for all the British heavyweights. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Appreciate what we have before it's gone. And I'll catch you guys on the next video. In fact, no, before I go, I just want to tell you about this week's exclusive boxing upload. I've just uploaded this video here. It's a film study over an hour long on Anthony Joshua and Daniel Dubois, where I analyze footage from several of their past fights, compare their styles, point out their habits and mistakes, strengths and weaknesses to help gain a better idea of how this fight may play out between them on September 21st.
If you want to access this video along with hundreds of hours worth of other exclusive boxing content, as well as our members chat, just head on over to my Patreon page and select the tier called The Boxing Brotherhood. There's no contract, no commitment. You can cancel at any time, just like Netflix, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Just download the app from the Play Store or the App Store. All the links are in the description box below.